good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Community Baptist uh, Combined Service. I'm going to get things started with a few announcements, um, and then Gerald's going to come up and do prayer requests. Uh, just a reminder, this evening we do have evening worship. That'll be in this building at 6 o'clock. Uh, Tuesday, weather permitting, is the Marywood Golf Fundraiser. Uh, also, Wednesday night, Prayer and Bible say right back here in this building at 7. Now, October is a very busy month. Just a reminder, if you are not registered to vote, October the 9th is the deadline. Johnny has some registration forms. If you want to register to vote, you need to get this done before October 9th. October is also Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, be sure you give say thank you to our pastors, both Jr. and Chris. Uh, they work extremely hard. We will be taking up love offerings for them on Sunday the 11th. Uh, the deacons will be standing about with a bucket or an offering plate or something, uh, but we will take up offerings on the 11th and the 18th. Also, we're going to try Children's Church starting Sunday, October the 11th. Sunday, October the 11th. What will happen is the parents will drop their kids off at the fellowship hall. There will be a deacon there um, that will take uh, the child's temperature. If it's good, we will let them in, and they will stay in Children's Church the whole time we're in service. Parents will come back over to this building. Once service is out, we're going to ask the parents to go back out the front door and go back to the same door, and there will be a deacon there, and they will release the kids from Children's Church. So we will start that Sunday, October the 11th in the morning. In the evening, we are going to try middle school and high school youth. Those kids will come in through the door. They will, we will take their temperature, and then they're going to go upstairs on Sunday night, October the 11th. So Children's Church will start that morning, uh, and middle school and high school youth will start that night. Um, also, we've got a couple guests, October 4th, Catherine Schoff will be with us, uh, Keith and Jody Hudak, our missionaries will be with us on the 18th. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer, October 31st, Halloween is on a Saturday night. Um, if you haven't heard, the CDC says they do not recommend trick-or-treating, and I don't know if kids will get to do it, and kids need to be back in a normal place. So we're going to offer trunk-or-treating in our parking lot. We're asking for 15 to 20 cars to sign up. It'll be a drive through trunk-or-treat. The kids will not get out of the car. Once they pull on the dirt road, they can uh, hang their head out the window. Um, we're asking that at the trunk or treat, there be two adults. So if there are two kids, one can look out one side, one can go the other, and that way one adult can walk around and drop candy in their bag. The people that are doing the trunk or treat, we're going to ask that you wear gloves and a mask. Um, but I think this is an opportunity to minister to people in our area, gives the kids an avenue of somewhere they can go and get candy. We're also going to share tracks with the kids um, this will be in the bags to share. So let's make this a great event. Uh, the church, if you will help us, we're going to need candy. Uh, we do not have a box in the foyer, but if you will help us out, we'll get a box out there, and, if you, and that way we can share candy with the people that's doing trunk or treat. Also, deacon nominations, uh, we do fall back. Uh, we, we gain an hour, uh, excuse me, we lose an hour uh, on November 1st. We also have deacon nominations November 1st, and then election day is November the 3rd. Calendars, calendars will be out. Next week or the sign-up sheet will. And also Christmas cards. I believe Judy Roof is making the Christmas cards. There is a book out in the foyer right on the left as you go out a blue uh, notebook that shows the Christmas cards that she will be making. Those you can purchase. Now, are there any other announcements that I need to mention at this time? Okay. I'm going to turn it over to JR. And let him do prayer requests. Good morning. It is good to see you. I do want to remind folks that if um, if you are playing in the Marywood tournament, you need to have all your stuff together probably by tonight. Uh, have all those forms filled out and all that stuff. You know all about that. Uh, and Lord willing, we'll be playing on Tuesday. Now, the weatherman's calling for 90% chance of rain on uh, Tuesday. And we know that the weatherman is 90% right 10% of the time, right? So y'all pray for good weather, and let's see if we can't get this thing in on Tuesday. Also, if you're looking for somebody to sponsor and you haven't, uh, you haven't sent any sponsorship money in yet, uh, I do know that Steve Baker's still looking for sponsorship, and Anthony Warden. Uh, I don't know. I know I've got, uh, I've got more than what I need. And uh, Rob, where's Robbie Barrett? Robbie, you got, uh, you got plenty. Robbie's got plenty. I've got plenty. So Steve and Anthony could use your help, and uh, I know they would appreciate that. Now, in the way of prayer requests, let's remember to pray for the Badgett family uh, there in South Africa, all those three ministries they've got going, and uh, especially the one in, uh, in Shalozi uh, where they have the Calvary Baptist Church, and they are building a building there. So let's pray about that and all the other works as well. Pray also for... Uh, let's see, Cheryl Cothran, she's, I think we can just about take her off. She's doing great. 
uh, was able to sing with us last Friday night in the concert over at Living Waters. Uh, so I think we can take her. I'll pray for Kenny Edwards. Uh, he's, you know, battling cancer. But uh, most of you probably have heard the great news that Kenny gave his heart to Christ here just a few weeks ago. And we do praise the Lord for that. Pray also for Anna Marie Garrett having trouble walking. Jack Goodwin dealing with prostate cancer. Uh, pray for Tony Graves. This is a young mother just in her 30s who had a pretty major heart attack. And uh, she's uh, had a 99% blockage in one of her arteries. Pray for Dr. Myron Gallo. This is a real concern of mine. Uh, he is a uh, friend for many, many years, and God has used him in so many ways. He has given his whole adult life to serving the Lord, and uh, now he has congestive heart failure. He's 86 years old. He needs to have a heart surgery, but the doctor said he didn't think he would survive it. So uh, he just sent him home and said, we'll try to treat it with medicine. So pray for Dr. Geiler. That's Myron Geiler and his wife, also Linda. Pray for them and pray for the Marietta Bible College and the school up there. Pray also for uh, Ray Humphrey, my good friend. Y'all continue praying for him. Lorraine Hunt, the Callum family. Carol and I attended this funeral yesterday at uh, Cedar Square. And uh, pray for his family in a special way. He was a good friend for many, many years. Pray for Dixie Kajeski and especially her son Joseph with the heart issues. Uh, pray also for... Uh, and Mabe, we think she's doing much better, but continue praying for her. Our daughter Mandy is in her 30th or 31st week of her pregnancy now, so pray for her. Uh, pray for George Mitchell. I think I saw him slide in. Well, there he is, and he had that mask down on his chin, and I thought he was growing a beard because uh, I didn't have my glasses on. But y'all pray for George. Uh, been battling some issues most recently, been battling gout. Pray also for the Miller family, uh, Sharon Osmond, my cousin, battling cancer, uh, Mary Paget uh, with some back issues. Uh, Yolanda Petty is going to be singing with us this morning, but uh, last Saturday night at Nick and Natalie's wedding and reception, uh, she started having an issue with her eye. So y'all pray for her. It's, I think it's getting better. And uh, But if she looks at you kind of cockeyed, you'll understand, all right? But no, y'all pray for her eyes. She had like a little hemorrhage in there, so y'all pray about that. Haley Phillips had uh, a double mastectomy this past uh, Thursday. I was able to get over to Baptist Hospital in the parking deck and pray with Shane and Nicole. Uh, but Haley went home the next day, staying with Shane and Nicole right now, and she'll have a post-op visit next week, and then the week after that she will have uh, reconstructive surgery. So pray for little Haley. She's only 25 years old. Pray for my cousin Janie Shepard battling cancer as well. Tommy and Sherry Welburn, Tommy battling Parkinson's disease. The Turney family, John's supposed to have a surgery coming up this week in Chapel Hill, so pray for him. Pray for all of our school teachers, our unborn. Pray for the elections coming up. Uh, I know Anthony's kind of pounded on that a little bit. I, I'm glad he has. Uh, it seems like every year it gets more and more important, but uh, I do certainly think this is one of the most important elections that uh, we'll ever be a part of. And pray for uh, President Trump and others as they try to nominate somebody to uh, replace the seat uh, from Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, just pray much uh, for all that process they got to go through. Uh, Dr. Geiler told me a long time ago, he said, uh, he said one of the most important things we can pray about is the judges, the judges, uh, because they have a lot of say so. So pray about that. Pray for the service this morning. Pray for us. Our quartet's going to sing in just a moment, and then Chris is going to come and bring another message from the book of Matthew. Let's get started in prayer. Miss Debbie, you got an unspoken, okay? Yes, Miss Betty. Ann Hepler has sciatic nerve problems. All right, we'll sure pray for one of our members, Miss Ann Hepler. All right, all right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, praying much for all these, and pray for our service today. Looks like we're just a little bit low on attendance today, so look around, see who's not here, and uh, tomorrow maybe call them and let them know how much you miss their smiling face. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to be in your house again this morning. And, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and the power of the one we're praying to. And, Lord, we recognize that you are God still on the throne, still in control of all things, and none of this has caught you by surprise. This has been an unbelievably unusual year, this year 2020, but, Lord, we know you're still in control. And we pray that somehow, some way, that you would use all this for our good and, more importantly, for your glory. Lord, we do pray for all these names that have been mentioned on the prayer request list. Pray that you would deal with each one of these folks as only you can do. 
deal with them individually in your perfect timing and according to your perfect will. We pray you bless the service here this morning. Thank you for every person that's made their way out, every home that's represented. I pray you bless the quartet as we sing, that our music would be from the heart for your glory and be used to prepare hearts for the message that Chris will bring in just a few moments. All these things we ask in the glorious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Roger Smith talked to the youth choir at Grace Baptist Church about a hundred years ago when I was still a youth. Steve, we're not youths anymore. I'm 63. Nobody has a clue how old Steve is because it's different every time you ask him. But uh, I like that song, Glory Road. Now, when I was growing up as a little boy, even before I was singing in the youth choir, I used to love to hear the Kingsman Quartet. And when I grew up, I thought when I grew up, I'm going to sing with the Kingsman Quartet, but the Lord had other plans. But one of the songs they put out years ago on one of their Big and Live albums, how many of you ever heard any of the Big and Live albums by the Kingsman? Big and Live, Chattanooga, Big and Live, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and all kind of places, you know. This song was on one of those live albums, and it's a beautiful song called Love Will Roll the Clouds Away. The clouds are the trials and the tribulations in our lives. And it's just talking about how the love for the Lord and how his love for us will just push all that stuff out of the way if we'll let him. Listen to the words of love will roll the clouds away. As the Lord life's way you go clouds may hide Turn the door. 
Matthew chapter 27, if you have your Bibles, it's good to see you here today. We do have some notes for you in the back. If you would like to just slip up your hand, we'll have some people deliver those to you. <clears throat> uh, Matthew chapter 27, what an exciting day this is. Um, actually had to, uh, got about a half day into this and uh, scrapped it after I realized I had been beating a dead horse if I'd done what I was wanting to do today. And so uh, I'm going to a whole new direction um, uh, this morning, then um, we're going to be in all four Gospels. And so I want you to pay attention because it definitely involves with what we're dealing with in our society and our world right now. If you uh, remember, we're going through now the second set of trials. We've already been through our first set. Three have already been accomplished, and we have three more to talk about today. There was a lull. There was a, a pause. If you remember Peter's denial, Judas's suicide, it was the first set of trials with uh, uh, Caiaphas and An uh, Annas, his, uh, the, high, the former high priest, his father-in-law. And then we have Caiaphas, and then we had that set of trials. There were three there. And then we have the second set of trial with Pilate and Herod, and there's three more, so a total of six. Some people say that there's seven, some people say that there are eight. For all intents and purposes, I don't believe that the people ever had a right to make a decision uh, if they were going to put or kill Jesus, and so we're going to stick with just six trials throughout this whole time. And we're going to look at 28. We only have a few sermons left. I, I think it's around eight, and I, don't hold me to that, but it won't be much more than that or less than that. So we're almost finished with this whole book here. And so we're going to look at the victory over death. As I told you, I, I scrapped my sermon, and, and the reason for that is because have we clearly covered the illegalities of these trials? I mean, is it been so clear that there was everything that is false about these trials? There's nothing, the justice system was right. The justice system was, was, was nearly flawless. I mean, in, in, in the grace and the mercy that they were showing. Here's the issue, is that it was the people that were involved in the justice system that caused all of this turmoil, that caused all this corruption. And so once again, I've started my journey with Pilate and Herod, and, and I just felt like I was just beating a dead horse. It was illegal, it was illegal, it was illegal. So I scrapped it all, and I wanted to talk about something different today. Do you remember that Alfred Tennyson, he wrote a poem in 1854, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600, Ford the light brigade charged for the guns. He said, into the valley of death rode the 600. Ford the light brigade, was there no man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. But theirs is not to make reply. Theirs is not to reason why. Theirs is but to do 
and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. And it continues on for two more paragraphs talking about a group of men who come against the Russian army. They rode one and a half miles into the Russian army, surrounded on three sides. In that mile and a half ride, 670 men rode into battle knowing that their leadership had made a mistake. They knew they were going to meet their doom. At 110 deaths in a mile and a half, 160 men were wounded in a mile and a half, and 375 horses were killed in a mile and a half. 160 years later, if you read the documents, they proved that it was a young lieutenant who had sent this order and led his men into a slaughter. I have a question. I say all of this talking about leadership, and I want to ask you a question. Does leadership matter? Does leadership matter? If this young lieutenant had taken the time, his responsibility, whatever it was, think about 110 lives, 160 wounded, 375 horses. What if it was your name at the bottom of that document and you had led 110 of your men to death and it was your signature? I would say that leadership matters. I want you to think about some of the leaders you've had in your life. I want you to think about maybe it was a pastor, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was a school teacher, maybe it was a boss or bosses, maybe it was one parent or both parents. I want you to think about there's some people in your life who have been leaders in your life and have made an example and you have followed this example. And this is the neat thing. Some of them, maybe all of them have already passed away or you have not even talked to them in 15 or 20 years, but you still think as highly of them today as you did when you were underneath their leadership. There's things that, there's leadership that when I was in college that they taught me, certain study habits, certain cleaning things, all the things that I still apply to my life today, and I've never met those people who set those rules. But because of great leadership, it filtered down to me. And to this day, these things are still practiced in my life. What I have learned, though, especially in this generation coming up and past generations, is people that are in leadership do not want to accept the blame. Do you agree? When something goes wrong. When things go right, they want to receive that. But when something goes wrong, they don't want to accept the blame. There is a term called blame shifting. I don't want it to be about me. It's this person's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my boss's fault. It's everybody else's fault but mine. There was a big conference and there was an there was a, a owner of a company. And he was talking to his salesman and he was talking to the leadership there. And he says, one thing that I will not stand for is you blame shifting your problems on somebody else. That if you have taken the role and you have taken the helm, it is yours. From start to finish, it is your responsibility. And he says, this is the story that I want to tell you that mimics that. A submarine captain docks his ship for the very last time after 20 years of exemplary service. And he hands the keys over to you. And on your maiden voyage, you get 100 miles out and you crash into an iceberg. And then he asked this question, who crashed the submarine? Who crashed the submarine? You know what he was saying? Leadership matters. And you have to take 100% responsibility for whatever leadership role you are in and not blame somebody else. And I want to tell you in this story today, more than ever, you'll see that leadership 
made a huge presence and big deal in this story we're going to talk about today. The next set of trials, as I said, we're going to take a different turn. Back in 2014, thousands of people were surveyed from different companies and they were uh, talking about the leadership that had been in their life and, and currently and in past. In 2014, thousands of people were interviewed and they said, what is an essential f to be a leader? 84% of the people said honesty was the number one thing for them to have this in a leader. Intelligence was the second most important thing. I want them to be intelligent in their wisdom and in their decision making. I want them to be decisive. I want them to be able to make a decision. I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. I want them to be organized. I want them to also be compassionate. That I want them to understand when my parents die, my kid is sick, and I don't show up, they're not railing me. I want them to be compassionate that we are people and we need to live life. I want them to be innovative. I don't want them being stuck in the same old thing year after year. I want them to be think outside the box. And I want them to be ambitious. And as I begin to look at this list, and, and nobody that I've ever seen really talks about this in this realm, but I begin to look at this list and I thought, wow, if I compare this to Herod and Pilate and the Sanhedrin, what do I find? I'm going to look at this list today, and I'm going to look at the scriptures, and we're going to compare the two and look at the leadership. The amazing thing about this as I talk about these people in Rome, as Herod and Pilate, and the responsibility that they have, I want to tell you this. You have a responsibility. You are getting ready to walk to the polls and cast a ballot. And the keys to the submarine are being put in your hand. And there must be a question that you're going to have to ask yourself no matter which way you vote. You're going to have to ask the same question Pilate asked, which I'm going to reveal at the end. And as an adult, no pastor, no person should tell you how to vote. As a Christian, you should not be, have to be told how to vote. As a believer, as a child of God who's walking in the light of the truth, nobody should tell you how to vote. But you're getting ready to be handed the keys to the submarine, and if the submarine crashes, you're going to go, well, it's their fault. What about your leadership role? What about your responsibility? We often want to blame everybody else. And as we get into these last set of trials, I want to take you this quick journey. If you see down here, we began in the upper room. It's this little yellow box right here. And if you just follow the red lines, the red lines, Jesus is leaving the upper room. And he walks through the temple and he ends up at the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is where he made his decision. This is where the stroke and the heart attack potentially was there. And we see that he's damaged his heart. We even see that all onto the cross. He was arrested and he's moved from the Mount of Olives down to Caiaphas' house and Annas' house. He's, he then leaves there, they take him outside of the temple, and they bring him all the way to the Tower of Antonio, and that's, that's where Pilate was, right here. And then they take him down, and we're going to see him go to Herod's house from there. And then Herod's going to release him and send him back to Pilate, and then we're going to be in Golgotha. And so the, the, the trials today is going to be Pilate, Herod, Pilate. As I said, Matthew does not cover the entirety in, this, in, this, in his book. You remember when we went through Peter's denial and I had to go through and draw the lines for you and, and we went through and we looked at the six denials? This is essentially what we're going to do today. Because one book doesn't cover, one of the Gospels doesn't cover the entire process. Matthew condenses all of Pilate's but doesn't talk about Herod. Luke does a better job at describing all of these. Now, as we look at trial number four, we're now into the Roman trial. We're looking at the trial before Pilate. 
He's now being taken from Cephas' house and he's led outside the temple. He's at the Tower of Antonio. And the first leadership, leadership failure that I see, number one, is the lack of intelligence or stupidity. I don't know about you, but some of you have had bosses that have showed no intelligence in their decision making, in their wisdom when they speak. Some of you have sat underneath these people and you haven't sat long because you think these people are going to lead us into the field of destruction. I want somebody that is intelligent, that at least knows what they're talking about, and if they don't, they're man or woman enough to admit, I don't know. As we get to John chapter 18, verse 29, Pilate said, now they've brought him in there. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, and Pilate says... What, why are you bringing him to me? I don't know about you, but at 6 a.m. in the morning, you probably not, did not wake up to a, a, a tremendous amount of Sanhedrin standing off. By the way, they could not enter into his courtyard or they would have been considered unclean. They would have not been able to take care of Passover. And so we have Roman soldiers standing there. We have temple guards standing out. We have the uh, high priest. We have, we have uh, Caiaphas. We have these people standing back and he's saying, what are you doing here? It is 6 o'clock in the morning. And so we know that at this time that he's pretty ill. He's upset, Pilate is. And then he says, what accusations do you have against this man? He knew about Jesus. He had heard about Jesus. And if he had never heard it before, he had been there for the Passover the whole week long. He knew about the overthrowing of the money changers. He knew about Jesus and his miracles. Why do you bring him? Pilate was not asking for uh, Pilate is not asking for proof, but what he is being accused of. He didn't say, "Bring me proof." But what is the accusation, okay? And then, let me show you the stupidity of the Sanhedrin. Here's the leadership. And this is how they answer. If this man were not an evil doer, we would not have delivered him to you. Pilate said, well, okay, then let's crucify him. I want you to think about this. 1998, I was sitting in my biology class in college. I had a brilliant professor. He was phenomenal. He was a chemist. I mean, he's, it was awesome. And he began to introduce me to things that I had never heard about or thought about in a certain way before. One of the words he introduced me to is called circular reasoning are also circular arguments. And he began to explain circular reasoning to me and circular arguments, and this is exactly what it is. This is when I want to begin an argument with what, I want, what I, with what I want you to end up with. I begin an argument with what I want to end up with. Let me explain what this looks like in an evolution term. In evolution, what we see is this. We see that scientists say the earth is millions of years old. And you ask them, how did they come to this conclusion? Because I found a rock that was a million years old. And by the way, the dinosaur that is beside the rock is millions of years old. Okay, how did you come to this conclusion? Well, the rock is millions of years old. The dinosaur that was, we dated the dinosaur off of the rock. So therefore, the dinosaur must be millions of years old. The dinosaur is a million years old because the rock is a million years old. The rock must be a million years old because the dinosaur is a million years old. Therefore, the earth must be a million years old. Did they prove? What did they do? Circular reasoning. You, by the way, here, here's some more examples. Everyone loves Rebecca because she is so popular. You must obey the law because it's illegal to break the law. Harold's new book is well written because Harold is a wonderful writer. America is the best place to live because it's better than any other country. You know what th these guys did here? This is what they said. If this man was not evil, we would not have brought him here. Did they prove anything? Is this an intelligent statement? And the answer is absolutely not. And by the way, Christians say and do the very same thing and all God's children say, yeah. Listen to what some of the Christians say. The Bible is true, so you should not doubt the Word of God. 
The Bible is true, so don't doubt the Word of God. You know what that is? Circular reasoning. Did you prove the Bible's truth? Did you prove why we should not doubt the Word of God? Did you look back at all the prophecies that's been fulfilled and study it out and understand this is why the Bible is true? Not because the Bible's true, so don't doubt the Word of God. That is terrible. And by the way, pastors teach this stuff all the time, Sunday school teachers. Here's another one. God exists because the Bible says so, and the Bible is true, so God must exist. The stupidity in some of the arguments that we show to prove to God. Why don't we get into the Word of God and prove His existence by His prophecy, by His creation? We can look around, Genesis, uh, Romans says, and know that there is a God. And we are without an excuse. We have a general revelation of God. And so here's the leadership. And they says, would we have brought this man to you? He's evil. And so here's the leadership failure number two. And now we're going to focus on Pilate. Luke 23, 1 says the whole body had got them up and brought them before Pilate. Now, let me pause. Bob came to me last week. We were talking about the Sanhedrin and how many we thought were there and all of this. The debate on how many of the Sanhedrin were actually there is, is a little bit difficult. Mark 15, 1 says, Early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and the scribe and the whole council. Now, as you continue to look through, we talked, about, um, we talked about two men. We talked about Joseph of Arimathea. We talked about he was the one who donated the, um, the cave, the casket, the, the tomb to, uh, to, to Jesus and another man named Nicodemus. Now, the truth is, I don't know if either one of these men were there or not there. All we know is Nicodemus was the one who came at night, hidden, asking for myrrh and asking for some of the spices. However, Joseph of Arimathea, all it says there, and he consented not to the plan of the Sanhedrin. But it does say in the book of Luke that he was a righteous man. I have no idea if Joseph Arimathea was there. It just says he didn't agree with the plan. But I, I don't know, maybe his presence, he was trying to talk him out of it. We don't know. Not everybody, though, was probably privy to the mock trials. I, I'm, we can only talk about what we can prove. We just know that there were a bunch of people that had, had established and come against Jesus. Poor, dishonest leadership is what I'm trying to get to. And this is what they said. And they began to accuse him. We found this man perverting our nation. We found this man perverting our nation. Now the accusations and the dishonesty is really getting ready to come out. Pilate is screaming, what are you doing here? What do you want? We found this man perverting our nation. Let's look at what this looks like. It means to twist, to turn to lead people away from the one true God. Now, by the way, do you really think Pilate cared about this? We're getting ready to see. He's getting ready to have a festival that celebrated all of his gods, plural. Do you think Pilate really cared about that Jesus twisted or turned? If that's what he, he was even being accused of, turned him away from Jehovah God, he cared less about that. So where I want to show you the dishonesty and get down to the, showing you the Sanhedrin and showing you the dishonesty of them, Jesus was never accused of twisting or perverting anything. However, the disciples were. Do you remember the man, do you remember the, the, the demonic boy? In Matthew chapter 17, we talked about this. And the disciples, the, 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 the dad took the demonic boy to the disciples and the, the, they could not heal him. And they brought him to Jesus and said, we brought them to your disciples, but they could not do that. And this is what Jesus said. He says, you unbelieving and perverted generation. Some people think he's talking about to, the, to all the Pharisees there. No, no, no. He's talking to his disciples and I'll tell you why. When this, when this healing was supposed to occur and the disciples were supposed to be able to have the faith to do this, they couldn't do it. And he says, you're twisting people away from the true and living God when you don't show the faith that you should show. Jesus was never, never accused of perverting 
or twisting away from God. He was there to point people to the Father. So that was the first lie. And then they said, by the way, he don't pay his taxes. Let's look if that's true. Did Jesus pay his taxes? Do you remember later on in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is sitting there having a conversation with his disciples about paying taxes. And remember, taxes and tithes were, were the same going into the temple. That's what it was for. In 1724, he says, does your teacher pay tax? They were trying to set him up. Does he pay the temple tax? And Peter said, yes. Do kings collect tax from their son? Later on, Jesus says, look, looks at the disciples. He says, do kings collect taxes from their sons? Now, I want to ask you this. If you owned a nation and you were responsible for taking in all the tax to pay the bills, to pay the land, to pay your salary, to pay the mansion upkeep, all that, do you walk to your son's room and knock on the door and say, hey, I need your tax? No. That's your son. And Jesus says, do kings collect taxes from sons or from strangers? And the disciple says, well, that's easy, they, from strangers. And then Jesus said this. By the way, they're giving it to the temple. Did Jesus have to pay tax to the father's house? Hello? Is he the son? You see what Jesus is getting at? I'm the son this is my father's house. Should I have to pay tax? And the answer is no. But then this is what he says. So that we don't offend them. Go to the sea, find a half a shekel in the fish's mouth, take it out and give it for you and give it for me. Did Jesus pay his taxes? So here's the second lie. Let's look at the third lie. And saying... He is a king. Now, what, what, what's the big deal here? Because if, you says that, if he said that he was a king, then he's putting himself in opposition of, of, of Caesar or putting himself above Caesar. If you were, hey, let's talk about the third line. Ready? Matthew twenty two twenty one 21 says this. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Did he ever say, I am going to take over? I'm going to establish my kingdom right now. I'm going to overthrow Caesar. No, the people said that, but Jesus never said that. So in just opening their mouth, we see the lack of intelligence. We see three lies so far quickly. This is the leadership of the Sanhedrin, of the religious people, of the people that should be leading their nation closer to God and the lack of intelligence and the dishonesty. And then we see Pilate's indecision. Let me say this. We talked about somebody who was decisive. What would you rather have? A leader that made wrong decisions or a leader that made no decisions at all? Think about it. People talk about people that make wrong decisions, but I want to tell you what, I have seen very poor leaderships of people that will say, well, let's just think about it. Let's just pray about it. Let me get back to you on that. Do you think you're ever going to hear back? After about the third time of hearing that, guess what you learn? They're not getting back with you. You know what that is? An indecisive leader they're not able to make a decision. It's nothing wrong with praying about it. There's nothing wrong with thinking about it. There's nothing wrong with let me look at the pros and the cons. But they don't ever come back and approach the situation. A leader can be just as damaging being a, the leader that doesn't make a decision as one who makes bad decisions. And here we have Pilate. Take him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we are not allowed, Pilate, to put anybody to death. Judge him according to your law. You know what he started saying from the very beginning? Get out of here. I don't want to deal with this. By the way, and then the amazing thing is, he, they had to tell him, we can't put him to death. You established the law, Pilate. You told us we couldn't. 
And now you're telling us, go do what we got to do. You know what Pilate was doing? Get away from here. I don't want to handle this. It's early. I don't want to have to deal with this. And therefore, Pilate entered into the praetorium and summons Jesus and said, are you the king of the Jews? We see here, we skip to John chapter 18 because we see here that this is where the storyline picks up. And Jesus is led in. And so they're forced when he says, we can't kill him. So then he's forced. You, can't you see him? Ah, ah, bring him up here. Ah, I'm tired. What? What'd you do? Are you the king? You know what he didn't say anything about the taxes, right? You know what the only thing he approached? Did you say you were king? And Jesus answered, Are you saying this because you're asking for you? Or you're just listening to other people? Are you asking this for yourself? Think about it. Here is a man whose life is on the line. And here's the questioning. Right, did you really say you were going to be king? And Jesus said, are you really asking this because you're wanting to find out the truth? Are you really searching for the truth? Is this your goal here? Or did others tell you? Are you trying to make a decision off of what they told you? Or are you trying to get down to the bottom of it? Pilot, because my life is on the line. Come on. Listen to how, listen to what Jesus is saying. He's not being disrespectful. He's calling him to the carpet. Be a leader, Pilot. And Pilot said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in here. In this man, there's nothing in here. And then, what did they do? Keep on insisting. He stirs up the people and teaching all over Judea, people in Galilee, as far as this place, all over, he wants to be king. All over, he wants to be king. And now there's a crowd, a bigger, larger crowd. It's, they're waking up the neighborhood, by the way. By the way, it's, we understand it's Passover and it's tons of people, and people are gathering. When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. Oh, did you say Galilee? Now, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and stop right here. <clears throat> I have no idea how Pilate got from this part to this part other than his indecision. Wait a minute. Did you say that he stirred up people in Galilee? Wait a minute. Is he from Galilee? <laughs> oh, that's not my department. You ever been on the phone with some of these companies? I about said it. And you've been waiting for 20 minutes and finally the person comes on and you say, I need to talk to somebody about my bill. Oh, that's not my department. Let me put you through. 20 minutes later, that's not my department either. You know what Pilate said? <laughs> Wait a he, Galilee? Oh, that's not my department. Are you kidding me? You know what he was doing? How many people walked through Galilee? He just assumed, wait a minute, he must be from Galilee. It was his way of casting Jesus off. Not my department. Send him to Herod. So then we see on the map where now he goes down to Herod. And Herod is in town because of this big governor's banquet that they're having. And Herod was glad to see him when he saw Jesus, for he wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him, and he was hoping to see some type of performance. So when you start reading this passage, you're thinking, wow, man, Herod was excited to see Jesus. What does Jesus and him want to talk about? And then when you get down to the bottom, you start thinking, what? He wanted to see him. And by the way, it was a genuine excitement. It was just a misdirected excitement. It wasn't, oh no, this man's life is on trial. I better make sure I know what I'm doing. But now we start seeing a very uncompassionate man, uncompassionate ruler, 
on a compassionate boss, uncompassionate administrator, an uncompassionate teacher. You, you see where I'm going? If there's something in leadership that you must have a balance of, it's compassion for people. And he says this, I'm hoping to see a miracle. I hope Jesus puts on one of the best dog and pony shows I've ever seen. I've heard about this guy, and I've heard about what he's doing, and I've heard about the miracles, and I just, hey, go get the lame person at the gate. Bring him in so Jesus will be right here. Go get him. Let's watch. Everybody look at this. This is how Herod is receiving this man that is on trial. And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, they dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him to Pilate. There's no way I can cover all the dictation that's happening in between these. There's a lot that's being said. But I'll give you the rundown. Basically, he's come before him, and when Jesus doesn't respond, because Jesus' heart was already settled in the garden, and Jesus doesn't put on this dog and pony show, Herod starts making fun of him because I think it embarrassed Herod. He's treating him with contempt, meaning he is beginning to utterly despise Jesus. And he began to mock. This word mock is interesting. It means to play a game with. You ever taken a young kid and you ever played a game with him and picked at him? You ever taken and tapped him on the shoulder and they look around looking for you? This is what they were doing with Jesus. They were playing games with the king of kings. And here's what they do. They dress him in a robe. Very interesting. I don't believe it was Herod's robe. We don't see any, any proof of that. They dressed him in a robe. And the robes then would be made out of fine linen. It would be made of bright colors. And those who wore bright colors in that day, they were doing something. Now, this is very interesting. Now, pay attention. If you wore a bright color, you were running for an office. And they dressed him up in this bright color. You know why? Because this man's running for king. <laughs> He's running for king. Everybody look at him. Go march him out in the street to make sure everybody knows that he is going to be our next king. He's running for the office. That was the implication, by the way, when they put that robe on him. And this is very interesting. He said, get him out of here. Because Jesus wouldn't talk to him. He wasn't putting on a dog and pony show. He wasn't entertaining Herod. He said, get him out. And then we go to Pilate. This is, but this is what it says before we go to the next trial. It says, now Herod and Pilate that day became friends and before that, they couldn't stand each other. What? Let me read that again. They became friends that day, but before that, they couldn't stand each other. And you know, I've, as I meditate and I think about this, they did what had been happening for centuries. I've thought about how much Jesus divides, 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 divides societies, divides this and that and the other. But you know what? I believe Jesus does divide, but I think he assembles as much as he divides. Now stay with me. I think he assembles those who are with him and those who are against him, they assemble. You see, when Herod sent Jesus back in this robe to Pilate, Pilate bust out laughing. That's awesome. That's funny. I like this dude. And that day they became friends because they rejected Jesus Christ and they assembled together. And there's another group that assembles together that is for Christ. No matter what, here's your assemblies.
And then the last trial starts just before he goes to Golgotha. The feast of the governor was accustomed to release the people, any prisoner whom they had wanted. Now, there's, a, there's a, some type of feast. I don't know that much about it. I can't find a lot of information on it. I'm just going to be honest with you. But Pilate's had some time to think about this thing, probably just a little bit, only because he really thought Herod was going to take care of Jesus at this point, and his hands were washed of it. There was some type of feast during this time where all the governors would come together and it was an honor of their gods. I mean, it was not un, un, uncommon for, for nasty orgies and food and drunkenness. I mean, it was terrible. But it also, because of the Jews, protested it so much and there was such a strained relationship between Rome and the Jews the Jewish governors had come up with an idea in order to help build this relationship back, and it was this. It was to show an act of grace or reduce attention or to hide all the stuff that they were doing, and it's we're going to release one prisoner. And we see an unambitious leadership failure. If I'm going to be ambitious, I'm going to show a strong desire, a strong determination to do what is right, pioneering, progressive, but if I'm not, I'm going to be lazy and unambitious. I think it's interesting how the governor is wanting to show grace on somebody who does not deserve it. And at that point, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Notorious prisoner, it was his trademark, what he was known for. In your spare time, you can look up Barabbas, but I've already done it for you. I've spent extensive time. I've looked at three historians that I tr uh, trust from church history, and nobody speaks of Barabbas after this. Barabbas, all we know is he's a notorious prisoner, notorious robber. In fact, the book of Luke calls him, and by the way, he's also on trial for murder. So we can see the background of this man's life. If there's anybody that should not have been let out of prison, he hadn't even been through trial yet, but he, he, was, he had done it. I mean, this is, this is who he was. This is who he was known for. We know nothing about him. I don't know anything else. We're going to move on because I don't know what happened to Barabbas after this. It could have been because of his lifestyle. He probably died shortly after that. And then we go to verse 17. And when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want to me to release? And they started screaming, Barabbas! Barabbas! And now Pilate, knowing the innocence of Jesus, is getting ready to, to, to trade a marked criminal because he's not willing to do what is right. This is Pilate. I want to tell you, this man was shallow. He did not have a backbone. He was hidden behind all of his cloud and all of his soldiers, but he had no backbone. Who do you want me to release? And the majority gets to choose. Or, by the way, what if this wasn't the majority? What if this is just the squeaky wheel that is getting the grease? Does this sound like what's going on today in our society? And here is a group of people that are screaming the loudest, therefore... They get the attention. And then verse 18, For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. What was the reason? What was the reason? For he knew, he had discerned, he had perceived, he had examined. You know what he was saying here? I know why this man is standing in front of me, and it's simply because they are jealous of him, and they're angry with him. Send him to be crucified. Listen, listen. He just admitted in his own mind, we see from the writers, Pilate knew why Jesus was there. Because people were angry and people were jealous. And that was the only reason. Pilate knew he had not committed one of these crimes that he was being accused of. But the governor said, which two do you want me to release? And they said, Barabbas. Which two? Which two? Which two? 
Some people believe that at this point, this is the seventh trial. And they believe that the people turned into the judge and the jury, but they did not have this authority. So that's why we're going to keep it with just the leadership. Pilate is not willing to be a leader. He is not willing to say, you're right or you're wrong. And then this is what he says. Then what shall I do with Jesus? You want to hear sermons on this? There's tons of sermons about what shall I do with Jesus? What shall I do with Jesus? And here's what it is. Pilate is testifying that he is totally responsible for this decision. Then what shall I do with him? That's what he's testifying to. I said at the very beginning, adults shouldn't have to be told how to vote. Most definitely Christians shouldn't have to be told how to vote. And this is why. Because if you want to know who you're marking your ballot for, this is the question they should be able to answer, is what do they do with Jesus Christ, period. And now you know how to vote. What do they do with the principles of God's word? Do they stand for truth? Do they stand for righteousness? Do they stand for what is correct? Or do they not? What are they doing with Jesus that's why Christians should not have to be told. You should do your research. You should know who you're voting for. You should know. And as Pilate said, what do we do with him? And they said, crucify him. And if Pilate was a true leader, it would have never reached this point because he had already testified that he knew that it wasn't correct. And in verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water, he washed his hands in front of the crowd, and I'm not, in, I'm not innocent, uh, I am innocent of this man's blood. See that to yourself. He started seeing, the crowd started getting bigger, started getting bigger. The, the devil was definitely working the crowd. The Sanhedrin were working the crowd, saying, and by the way, it's not probably unusual that people were being paid off to what? To riot. And there was a riot that was starting. And you know what Pilate would rather do? I would rather to appease the rioters than to stand for truth. And this is what he says, ready? He's just appeasing his conscience. I am innocent. And all God's children said, no, you're not. Because the minute that you said, I'm stepping in, this is my office. I am the leadership of this. And I know that they are wrong. He became guilty. He can do all the actions of washing his hands and all this. And by the way, we see later on in church history that Pilate actually committed suicide because of another scandal that he was involved in. And last, in 26, then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified the only reason, I believe, Pilate released this criminal was because of the riots and not because of standing for truth. And he handed him over because he was a poor, he was weak leader. And I want to tell you this, God already sovereignly knew this and that's why he was in that position because God knew he could not stand in that, in that position. I say all of that to say today that leadership matters. And you're going to be handed to the, the keys to the submarine. And the question that you have to ask is what do they do with Jesus Christ? Father, I love you today and thank you for putting leaders in our life, putting teachers and pastors and bosses, people that have had a huge impact on us. We're not perfect. But God, I pray that we would look at these three men in the Sanhedrin and vow not to stoop to the level that they have in their leadership roles. God, we're getting ready to be handed the keys to the submarine, so to speak. And I pray that each believer in here would vote based upon the scriptural, biblical principles that you've laid before us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We hope you have a great day.